alaikum from the holy city of Karbala. Today, I was pondering on the greatness of Imam Hussain and the greatness of Karbala, the greatness of the story that we've been hearing over the past few days and we'll continue to hear to the 10th, of, 10th day of Muharram, the day of Ashura. And I wrote a short couplet about the Ansar of Imam Hussain who the people of Karbala are commemorating today, which says, I saw Habib ibn Mudahir at the foot of the battle kneel. He says, Allahu Akbar, God is great and Hussein is actually real. SubhanAllah. Sometimes I sit, today even, in fact I was sitting outside the grave of Imam Hussain and despite all the things we hear, all the lessons we hear about, the beauty of Imam Hussain, I was sitting there and thinking, SubhanAllah, in the midst of all this, someone like Imam Hussain is actually real. His story is actually real. His story actually happened. His values and freedoms, there was actually a person that stood up for such values and freedoms that we learned from till today. And as we know, it's the main thing we hear about the story of Karbala, that Imam Hussein Islam stood up and gave everything, his whole life, the, family of, the lives of his family and his, and his companions, for the sake of his values, for the sake of freedoms. And as we speak about the journey of Imam Hussein Islam from Medina to Karbala, in the context of what we can learn from it today in the 21st century, the one thing we want to tackle tonight, inshallah, is what exactly are the true values and the true freedoms that Imam Hussain Ali stood up for. As I mentioned, as me and my respected guest Sayyid Ali mentioned and talked about on the first night of these live shows, we living where we live, where all, where all of you watching I'm sure live as well in the West, where there is democracy, there is freedoms, have this idea of freedom, which is to do anything that you want. And we asked ourselves, is this the same freedom that Imam Hussain Ali stood up for? Because where we come from, we have the freedom not just to live in peace, but the freedom to sin as well, the freedom to indulge in sin. And is that, in fact, is that the same type of freedom that Imam Hussain Islam stood up for? Was it not that Imam Hussain stood up for the freedom not just to live in peace, but also from the freedom from being enslaved to a desire, from being enslaved to a tyrant? And shall we're going to discuss that? Today, inshallah, with my respected guest, Sayyid Ain Nawab. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you. So, let's dive straight into the topic. Uh, and as the viewers can hear, mashallah, the processions are very loud behind us here in the Holy City of Karabala. So, do forgive us if perhaps the sound is a bit loud outside, if perhaps we have to raise our voice. But the emotions are very high as it comes towards the day of Ashura. You can see old Kibbs processions coming uh, from uh, people who are from Turkey, Iranians as well, and Pakistanis all joined together in their own processions that go well into the early hours of the morning lamenting the tragedy of Imam Hussain Islam. Sayyidna, everyone here is here to commemorate not just the story of Imam Hussain, not just because he was, even though this is perhaps one of the greatest tragedies, the grandson of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, but also because the reason he stood up was for the values and freedoms that we hold so dearly to. And that's why his message is not just something that speaks to Muslims or just even Shias, but all Muslims and even people of non-faith. So when we ask ourselves what exactly were the values and freedoms that Imam Hussain stood up for, how would you respond to that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would like to welcome our dear viewers and guests who have joined us once again through the Imam Hussain TV here in this holy city of Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam makes a very beautiful statement and through that statement he outlines the, the sole uh, purpose and the sole aim and objective of this movement and that is when he says أن أمر بالمعروف وأنهى عن المنكر وأسير بسيرة جدي وأبي علي بن أبي طالب صلوات الله وسلامه عليه. As you yourself and the respected guests and viewers at home know that Islam is a set of rules and regulations. The Islamic civilization is a set of values that رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم strived very difficultly to establish. These um, uh, values and principles, and Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when he comes and outlines the fact that um, this movement of mine 
is not on account of stubbornness. إني لم أخرج أشرا ولا بطرا ولا مفسدا ولا ظالما. There may be people that will come and say that Hussein, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, has come out and is the cause of fasad. Is the his movement is going to cause corruption? Imam from the beginning outlines that because he knows that in the future people are going to make those assumptions. إني لم أخرج أشرا ولا بطرا ولا مفسدا ولا ظالما and I do not want worldly desires and I am not in, in, in uh, instigating or I have not been instigated by the devil وإنما and that is وإنما خرجت لطلب الإصلاح في أمة جدي and I have risen solely for the whole reason of seeking reform in the nation of my grandfather, the Holy Prophet of Islam. Now, that again outlines, highlights what level or to what extent the nation of Islam, the, the Ummah of the Holy Prophet had reached in disobedience to the Islamic laws. And that it needed someone like Abi Abdullah al Hussein, so high ranked in the family tree of the Holy Prophet, to rise in that climate, in that uh, situation, to stand against uh, uh, tyrants like Yazid ibn Muawiyah on all the levels, on all the um, principles that Yazid was trying to establish in the Islamic Ummah, just to reform the Islamic nation. And why didn't the Imam use uh, for example, I am seeking the reform of these two na two groups. For example, the group of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, and for example, my group. Why did the, the Imam alayhi salam say, I seek to reform the nation of my grandfather? Because the whole of the Islamic Ummah had been affected by this virus. The whole of the Islamic Ummah had reached a level where they had neglected general rules and regulations of the Islam. Can I ask you, we talk about the Battle of Karbala, and in terms of the history, it took place a mere 60 years after the Holy Prophet died, after the Holy Prophet himself had perfected religion, had, had, had brought this perfect, uh, had perfected morality, had perfected values. How did people sway so easily in just a mere 60 years that Imam Hussein had to give his blood and everything he had for these same values and freedoms? And that's a very good question, and the answer to that is that Things did not start 60 years. It was a gradual movement towards um, the Ummah leaving the real message of Islam. And that gradual descent was started from the first day after the, the, the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet wasallam. It started with the Saqifah of Bani Sa'adah. It started when the so-called um, companions of the Holy Prophet decided to deprive and to steal and take away the Khilafah from Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is a statement that is widely used. If uh, Saqifah was not established, if the attack on Fatima al-Zahra had not taken place, the events of Ashura wouldn't have taken place. So that was the first movement of the hypocrites and the non-believers towards the gradual um, descent of people after they had been elevated to the ranks of being uh, individuals uh, uh, described in the Holy Quran by the Holy Prophet Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas At one time, you the nation of Rasulullah, you was the best ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to use you as an example for the other nations. كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر because you enjoined good and forbidden evil Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described you as the best of the nations. But when you left these two things, that's why Abi Abdullah al-Hussein says وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ 
and the whole reason that I have risen how am I going to seek reform in the nation by taking them back to those two principles that you, they used to actually practice before Amr bil ma'ruf an nahi an al munkar and that shows how important Amr bil ma'ruf an nahi an munkar is because it all outlines the true meanings of the values and freedoms in Islam and the true values and freedoms being practiced and being um, preached by the Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt and the Ulama and the Maraja these days are the values and freedoms that we see the Western societies uh, preaching and conveying that they are looking for these kind of things like freedom of speech, freedom of rights, freedom of um, opinion, uh, human rights. Freedom of oppression. Accent, oppression, and um, uh, protecting the, the female, protecting children, um, stopping poverty, all of these things, they were established in the government of Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib. For example, let me give you a beautiful example from the life of Amir al Mu'mineen. The day that Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked by the people, to assume leadership after the Ummah um, faced problems and situations after the first two um, so-called Khalifs. Amir al-Mu'mineen told them, listen, I, Ali ibn Abi Talib, it's true that I am your leader and I am ruling and governing over a wide area of land on today's um, map. But let me tell, tell you something, that I have the same rights and obligations as the rest of you it's not right that just because i am a leader or i am a, a minister or i hold um, a office a special office in the government it means that i have to use that power i have to feed my own interests and lusts and i leave the rest of the ummah the rest of the nations to strive to whatever they need and neglect their rights. No. Oh, people of the West, if you are looking for the true meanings of values and freedoms and rights, and if, if you want to abolish poverty and crime against members of the society, against the women, against the children, wherever they may be, come and read the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu because in the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib you will find segments like these that he as a leader comes and says to the Muslims O oh Muslims I as a leader I have the same lifestyle as you do not only Ali ibn Abi Talib if you say he is the Khalifa he is the leader he has been chosen and appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I will come and say to you no I'll give you a lower example. Salman al muhammadi Salman, when he was appointed by Ali ibn Abi Talib during the rule of the second leader, Salman traveled lightly. He didn't have any mata, any belongings to take with him. The people of Madain came to the outskirts of the city waiting for the, the caravan of the new ruler, the new leader been appointed on, upon them and they noticed that a man riding uh, a donkey with a prayer mat and a water container is entering the city they asked them did you not see the the companions of the new leader the leader his uh, whole caravan coming into the city he said no I haven't seen such a leader that you are describing but if you are asking about the leader appointed by Ali ibn Abi Talib to rule Mada and I am. He was all alone carrying a piece of clothing, a prayer mat and a water container. And he told them, the day that I am entering to your city to become your leader and I am carrying a piece of clothing and a prayer mat and a water container is the same day or the same style and the same way I will be leaving 
if I am leaving and you observe me leaving with more than these three items, know that I have not ruled you according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And say it's so funny because you, you speak about how people in the West who are oppressed, who are in need of some hope, they should learn from the message of Imam Sayyid Islam and Ahl Bayt. Reminds me of um, speaking to uh, a Shia African American Muslim who used to be a reverend. And she told me, she said, uh, I go to these impoverished ghettos, African American communities all over the states, all over America, where there's gun violence, there's drug problems. You know, these, they, as you know, in America, there's very systematic racial oppression. Yes. And she goes, I go to these communities and I tell them about the story of Imam Hussein. And I see these people stand up and say, if we were there, we would, you know, in the way they speak, we would, we would protect this Hussein. How could they do this to, to, to our, our brother Hussein? How could they do this to our master Hussein? People who, aren't even, who don't even believe in religion. And subhanAllah, it reminds me of that saying from the Ahl Bayt where they say, if people knew the beauty of our words, they would surely come towards us. Similarly, if we tell the oppressed people of the world the message of Imam Hussein, there is no doubt they would cling to it. And of course, as you said, the message of Ahl Bayt and Islam as well. Accent. And if that message was to be conveyed, and I repeat, if that message was to be conveyed to the people of the world, and why do I say the world? Because the day that his grandson is going to come back, he's going to stand by the curtains of the Holy Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and shout with a high-pitched voice and say, Ala ya ahl al-alam. He will not come and say, Ala ya ahl al-islam, or Aya Shia, or Muslims, or oh followers. Of Hussein, he will say, "Ala ya ahl al alam, inna jaddi al Hussein, qutila atshana." Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam, he will come and ask people of the whole world, not the Islamic world, the Western societies. He will come and say, "You Westerners." You carry the banner of freedom. You want to abolish poverty. You want to make sure that every poor child, every um, toddler, every infant that is born without parents, every orphan is able to live a life similar to the other children who have not been deprived of their parents. You call to your religion or you call people to yourselves in the name of freedom and values come and see what values and what freedoms my grandfather Abi Abdullah al Hussein was deprived of the simplest thing that people of the world today live in the comforts of their houses and they have clean water in the majority of the parts of the world and the United Nations and the um, organizations that work for human rights, they strive to build and dig wells to give and provide clean and healthy water to the um, povert um, poverty struck areas in Africa and Asia because they see that human beings are so unique that they have to be offered clean water. That's water Abi Abdullah al Hussein did not receive on the day of Ashura. In the Jaddi al Hussein, Qutila Atshanan. In the Jaddi al Hussein, Qutila Mazluman. My grandfather Hussein was killed in a, in a very humiliating way. He was oppressed. People of the West, the free thinkers of the world today, they call. The governments, they call the uh, NGO organizations to stop poverty and oppression all over the world. And this is what Abi Abdullah al Hussein called people on the day of Ashura. In Lam Yakun Lakum Deen, Wakuntum Latakhaf, Fakunu Ahraran fi Dunyakum. Be free. Do not let individuals pull you towards this lifeless very low and shallow life the world the dunya so what reform did abi abdullah al hussein 
ask for in Karbala in the event of Ashura and that reform was that he wanted to teach people to bring back people to the true meanings of the values of Islam which were the values of humanity to live safely to live in security to live in a healthy lifestyle to have their rights given to them you want to speak freely without being oppressed without anyone terrorizing you you will you would have found it in the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib you would have found it in the um, time of the ruling of Abi Abdullah al Hussein people used to come and stand opposite Abi Abdullah al Hussein in the streets of Medina and say are you the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib because the media was very very strong in Sham and they used to send their spies and their um, aid workers to come and tell the different areas of the Muslim Ummah that Hussein ibn Ali is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib who did not even pray that's why when Ali ibn Abi Talib was killed and martyred in the mosque the people of Sham asked what was he doing in the masjid did he even pray for him to go to the masjid so that individual who was from Sham stood against in front of Abi Abdullah al Hussein in the, in the streets of Medina and he said why are you calling people towards Islam when you do not practice Islam yourself and he started insulting Abi Abdullah al Hussein and how did the Imam receive him again teachings of the values and um, rights in Islam that the ruler accepts the opinion of the others without oppressing them without capturing them and placing them in prisons Abi Abdullah Hussein said I see you you are not from the city of Medina you are a foreigner and Tagharib if you need money come I will help you financially Imam wants to establish a rule that the leader and the ruler the ruler has the obligation to support people financially how many governments do we have today? How many countries do we have today? Is there a government that honestly can come and say that we do not have a single poor person in, under our rule? There isn't a single rule on the face of this earth today that can, can uh, come and claim that we do not have poor people in our government. And that was the case in the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Hussein ibn Ali, the son of that great leader, Ali ibn Abi Talib, wanted to bring people back to that same value, to let people live in good financial situation. Yazid ibn Mu'awi, one of the things that he done, because Abi Abdullah says, Yazid is a corrupt individual. One of the things that he corrupted in Islam was that he deprived poor people from their rights. How? I will tell you. Those who, who used to believe that they were the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he used to wipe their names away from the Baytul Mal, from the treasury. Why? I thought there was freedom of expression and freedom of speech in Islam. I thought the messenger of Islam and Ali ibn Abi Talib were individuals that called people to the freedom of speech and freedom of practice. So why is Yazid ibn Muawiyah the one that is saying, I am the leader of the Muslims and he is ruling the Islamic nation according to his version of Islam, which people until today, 2018, are following his footsteps. Why is he wiping away the names of Muslims from Baytul Mal? Because they love Ali ibn Abi Talib. And what's wrong with loving Ali ibn Abi Talib? Was Ali ibn Abi Talib, God forbid, someone who was violent for you to stop people loving him? Was Ali ibn Abi Talib someone who was a corrupt leader and a corrupt ruler? No, you was. Yazid was someone who used to be so corrupt that he used to take taxes from the Muslims. And if they did not pay taxes, he would have beaten them, killed them 
and destroyed their houses upon their heads. And where did he used to spend those taxes? For the sake of the Muslims? No. He used to give it away to his family and to his clan, to the Umayyads. This was the different sides of the freedoms and values assumed by Yazid, who corrupted the Islamic world, who said, I am the leader and this is my version of the values. And Ali ibn Abi Talib and his son Hussein ibn Ali sallallahu alayhi taught us the real meanings of values and freedoms. And this is widely and very openly uh, embodied and manifested by, excuse me, by the um, presence of the noble companions of Abi Abdullah al Hussein in Karbala. So then, Sayyid, let me ask you this. You're telling me about time, and as we know, the time of Imam Hussein al Hussein, where he stood up against such a corrupt leader that those values and freedoms were not present, and that so many refused to stand with those values and freedoms. How is it that the Ansar of Imam Hussein were able to see these true values and freedoms, able to recognize these true values and freedoms? Someone like Hor saw truth in these values and freedoms and was able to stand for them and die for them. How, what did they see that the rest of the Ummah did not see at the time? Ascent. This is as a result of many issues. One of them being is that Abi Abdullah describes why the people who were once upon a time so much religious that they memorized the Holy Quran, they prayed Salat al Layl, they uh, did Salat al Jama'ah, they led people for Salat al Jama'ah, and they were companions of the Holy Prophet. Some of them were companions of the Holy Prophet, or at least heard the message of the Holy Prophet, but they decided to stand against Abi Abdullah al Hussein. What did they not see that the um, close companions of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein so one of the things as Imam Hussein alayhi salam says Muli'at butunuhum aw butunukum min al-haram when someone takes a piece of food and that piece of food contains haram that haram food that is entering your existence will deprive you from seeing the right from the wrong Ali al-Akbar comes and says to his father, Abaya Hussein, Father Hussein. And in another um, situation, Lady Zainab says to Imam Hussein, Alam tukhbirhum, did you not inform them who you are? Imam Hussein says, yes, I told them. Do you not know my grandfather? Do you not know my father? Do you not know my mother, Fatima al-Zahra? And they say, we do, we know who you are but we're still going to kill you. They know Imam Hussein and they know the Quran and they know Islam. And this is one of the things. The other thing is that their minds were diluted so much as a result of the, the media machine of Bani Umayyah. As today, we see a group of youth, group of people being carried from, light, uh, from right to left and from left to right and, and and that is as a result of them just listening, merely just listening, without investigating, without going behind um, history and behind the books and opening books to find out where the truth lies. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam meets an individual like Farazdaq. Farazdaq was a poet, and the Imam says to Farazdaq, "Ya Farazdaq, inna ha'ula," directing his speech against the people of Kufa and the people that decided to go with Umar ibn Sa'ad. Ya Farazdaq, inna ha'ula lazimu ta'at al-shaytan wa taraku ta'at al-rahman. They decided to listen to the shaytan and they decided to leave the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa adharu al-fasad and as a result of them obeying the devil and leaving the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam which was obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they made fasad and corruption so apparent. Adharu. Wa adharu al-fasada fil ard wa abtalu wa sharibu al-khumur wa sta'atharu fil amwali 
واستأثروا في أموال الفقراء والمساكين. And as a result of them practicing all of these corruptions, they deprived poor people from their wealth and from their money. Why did the companions of Abi Abdullah al Hussein decide to accompany him? And they knew from beginning, Abi Abdullah reminded them, "Man lahakabi istashhad," and whoever is going to join me is going to become a martyr. Don't think that whoever is going to in to join me is going to receive a high position in the government or is going to hold office or is yeah. going to yes or is going to get wealth and money and going to loot and take the booties of the wars and the battlefield no Abi Abdullah al Hussein we can't accept anyone coming and saying these people they didn't know what was waiting for them we would come and say Abi Abdullah al Hussein since day one informed the people of Medina and again repeated himself in Mecca and every station that he stopped from Mecca to Karbala the Imam used to remind his companions and until Imam reached the city of Karbala his companions is the ones who traveled with the Imam Salamallahi Alayhi they were in the thousands mm -hmm. but what made them leave the Imam as they left Muslim Ibn Al-Aqil before him is the fact that the Imam Alayhi Salam used to test them used to remind them Gradually, gradually telling them, listen, people are going to kill me. And they are going to kill anyone that is going to be standing by me. You are not going to receive any wealth. They are fooled if they are, think, they are thinking that they are going to be given the governance of specific areas of land. Directing his speech to Umar bin Sa'ad when he was promised that they were going to give him the governance of, of Ray. And the Imam told Umar ibn Sa'ad, the funny thing is that the Imam told him, Oh Umar ibn Sa'ad, you think that Yazid is going to give you the governance of Ray? By Allah, he's not going to give it to you. He's not going to give it to you. You are going to be taken because you are going to participate in my death. You are not going to benefit from this life and you are not going to benefit from the hereafter. So here... Just, upon, just, just, to, just to throw in a quick point. Um, I, I remember hearing uh, in a lecture, perhaps it, I'm not 100% sure if it's Sahih, but I remember um, I think it was Omar and Sa'ad or one of the killers of Imam Hussein uh, when he requested what he was uh, expecting. He said, "Well, you killed Imam Hussein. God knows what you'll do to me exactly. if, if, if I let you, uh, if, exactly. if I give you the power." So exactly. finally, he lost in both aspects and said, "We have about, I'd say, about 10 minutes left. Um, so, 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 just tell us, you know, um, these Ansar, what was?" their final story and how did they and what were these values and freedoms that they, they really grasped on in those in those last few moments in that, in that last 24 hours in that in that last 24 hours lady Zainab came and asked Abi Abdullah al Hussein, have you tested the real intentions of your ashab have you asked them have you told them because I oh brother Hussein, I fear that tomorrow they are going to leave you all alone and Imam Hussain alayhi salam says to his sister Zainab, Ukhtah ya Zainab, I'lami, know, inna haula ashabi min alam al-dhar. Those are my companions and I know them from the life before, from alam al-dhar. Wa bihim wa'adani jaddi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. My grandfather, the Holy Prophet, gave me the names and the details of my companions. They are the ones who are going to be killed and martyred with me tomorrow. Muhammad ibn Hanafiyyah comes and says, وَإِنَّ أَصْحَابَهُ عِنْدَنَا لَمَكْتُوبُونَ أَسْمَاءُهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ وَأَسْمَاءِ آبَائِهِمْ From the time of the Holy Prophet until the time of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein, those true companions, they were known to Ahlul Bayt alayhim as As we have narrations, let me just give you this narration so our dear viewers become pleased because they are lovers of Ahlul Bayt, because they carry the love of Ahlul Bayt in their hearts. Your names, Ahlul Bayt, say, In Asma Shi'atana wa Muhabbina, Walladina Yazuruna Qabr al Hussein, Walladina Yabkuna al Hussein. Their names and the names of their parents are recorded next to us. The companions, they were so sincere in their 
honor and dignity towards Abi Abdullah al Hussein that this ayah falls upon them. Rijalun sadaqu ma ahadullah alayhi. And this is the verse that Abi Abdullah al Hussein was reciting after the demise and the death and the martyrdom of every single companion that used to go to the battlefield and not come back. The Imam used to recite this verse of the Holy Quran. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرُ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And they never changed their stand and their opinion about Abi Abdullah al Hussein. They saw what was happening on the battlefield. But each one was advising and saying, for example, Muslim Ibn Awsajah said to Habib, Ya Habib, I want to give you my wasiyya. What wasiyya was that? He said, Usika bihadar gharib. Do not leave this yeah, Imam who is going to be all alone. Do not yeah, leave him. Who are these individuals? They were individuals who Imam Salamullahi alayhim says, Inni la a'lam ashaban khair min ashabi. Upon all the companions of the prophets and messengers and the imams, I do not know any companions better than my companions. So what levels did these individuals reach amongst those strong brave warriors was an individual by the name of Abis Ashakiri go and read the life of Abis Ashakiri he is an individual that was known for his bravery he was a lion on the battlefield he saw the true meanings of the values and freedoms that Abi Abdullah al Hussein was speaking about. That's why he came and sacrificed himself on the battlefield. Do you know how he went to the battlefield? First, he entered the battlefield with a shield and a sword and an armor. As, as usual, as normal, as all the soldiers go to the battlefield with all of these equipment. But soon he noticed that no one is coming towards him. They are all afraid. Omar bin Sa'ad spoke to his uh, army and said, Save yourselves. Run away. This is Abis. Usually commanders and army generals, they try to push strength and power into the souls of their soldiers. Telling them, why are you running away? Go to the battlefield. Fight. But in this situation, Omar bin Sa'ad was saying to his army, men and soldiers, Save yourselves. This is Abis. Who was Abis? Abis was an individual that at the end, he decided, I haven't come to the battlefield just to play. I've come to save and protect the life of Abi Abdullah and Hussein. I've come to take away these individuals from in front of the path of Abi Abdullah and Hussein. So what does he do? And this is a strong and brave warrior. He throws away his shield. He throws away his armor. What else? He takes away his helmet. He throws to one side his sword. He takes off his clothing, but leaves his pajamas and goes and charges the wall towards the army of Umar bin Sa'd. His friends and companions in the army of Imam Hussein say to him, What's wrong with you, Abis? Are you okay? Ajuninta ya Abis? Have you gone crazy? Look at the statement of this brave man. Naam, he says, yes. Why? What has made him reach this level for him to say, Hubbul Husseini ajannani? The love that I carry for Hussein ibn Ali has made me crazy. For him to enter the battlefield without a sword. Another individual was by the name of Wahab. Wahab was a Christian young man who before the events of Ashura, before arriving to Karbala, he was a newlywed young man who was a Christian and he was traveling with his newlywed wife and his mother upon 
reaching the camp of Abi Abdullah al Hussein and arriving at the route of Abi Abdullah al Hussein before arriving to the land of Karbala, Abi Abdullah al Hussein sends after him, calls him, speaks to him, invites him to join him, speaks to him about the values of Islam, speaks to him about his position and how these people are oppressing him. It's the mercy of Muhammad. It's the mercy. Even because towards death. He wants to save him. He wants to tell him, Ya Wahab, join me. Because if you join me, you will be rewarded with paradise. Wahab, on the day of Ashura, he comes and says to his mother, Oh mother, what shall I do? The companions of the Imam are going to the battlefield. From one aspect, my wife is saying to me, Don't leave me alone. We have just been married. If you go to the battlefield, you will be killed. Who are you going to leave me? For. And from one aspect, you, my mother, you're pushing me towards the battlefield. What shall I do? The mother was saying, Ya Wahab, go! Go to the battlefield. Hami hurama Rasulillah. Give your life for the sake of Hussein ibn Ali. Do not listen to your wife. Wahab says, I charge towards the battlefield. Wahab was a young man who was very brave. He fought fiercely until... He was struck and he fell to the ground. He was bleeding heavily. Suddenly he looks back and he hears the voice of his wife who was telling him, do not go to the battlefield. His wife was saying, Ya Wahab, stand up. Qatil duna tayyibin. Fight and protect the life of the beloved family of Rasulullah. He says to his wife, Moments ago, you was telling me, do not go to the battlefield. What happened? His wife says to him, Ya Wahab, la talumni. Inna wa'iyat al-Husayn kasarat qalbi. I cannot bear to stand and hear the call of Hussein saying, Ala min nasirin yansurini. Ala min dhabbin yadubbu an hurami rasulillah. And this was the situation after all the companions went to the battlefield one by one and Abi Abdullah al Hussein was all alone. Bani Hashim went and never came back. The companions went one by one and never came back. It was time that Abi Abdullah al Hussein was all alone. He started looking at the bodies of the Ansar. Saying, يا أبطال الصفا وفرسان الهيجا ما لي أناديكم فلا تجيبون moments later إمام looked at the battlefield looked at the fields and started calling Ya Muslim Ya Burair Ya Zuhair Ya Habib Ya Hur Ma li ad'ukum fala tujibun When I call you and I am your Imam. Why do you not answer my call? Do you not see me all alone between the thousands of the army of Umar bin Sa'd? When the Imam did not receive any reply, it's as if he said, When come. نادى وينكم يا اهل الحميه غبت فرد غاب علي انا منين اجتني الغاضريه خلصوا هلي كلهم سويه لما راى صبت أصحاب الوفا قتلوا نادى أبال ف 
الفاضل أين الفارس البطل وأين من دوني الأرواح قد بدلوا بالأمس كانوا معي واليوم قد رحلوا وخلفوا في سويد القلب نيرانا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد peace and blessings be not only on Imam Hussain alayhi salam but also his noble companions and we see the great reward of these noble companions long after their death not only do we still narrate their stories alongside the story of Imam Hussain alayhi salam but when we come to the, to the shrine of Hussain in Karabala we see just by his, his, his grave there is a mass grave of all these wonderful martyrs which millions of people visit and must visit once they visit the grave of Hussain alayhi salam and shall we back right after the break with my guest Sayyid Ali Hakim, where I inshallah we shall be reading some poetry and Sayyid Ali shall be reciting some lamentation inshallah. We shall see you then. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.